Sam's Top 10. Hey guys, this is Sam. Now, it's no secret that every year an absolute slew of video games come out. And, with the vast quantity of titles hitting shelves, there are always going to be a couple of games that are really, really great, but never get their day in the sun, and unfortunately just don't shift or get talked about. So today I'm going to set that right to a degree by talking about my top 10 underappreciated gems in video games. Now, a couple of quick rules before we begin. One game per franchise. We are not tying this to any one specific platform. And uh, where possible, I've started with the first game in a series. Although there will be exceptions to that because, hey, it's my list, not yours. Also, it is my list, so it will be down to personal opinion and yours may differ. But if it does, that's okay. We can always discuss it in the comments down below. Without further ado, let's get going. Number 10. During the age of Crash and Spyro, there was another 3D platformer that got a lot of my attention. Croc. Originally, the game had been pitched to Nintendo as a title starring Yoshi. To say Nintendo were protective of their franchises after certain disastrous CDI titles was an understatement, so the game was retooled as a fresh IP. Croc will bring a smile to the face of anyone obsessed with collecting every last thing in a game. This beauty was made back in the days when your efforts were rewarded with more than just an achievement or trophy. In each level there are six gobos, tiny little creatures that inhabit the land. Find all of these in three consecutive levels, and you'll unlock a secret level containing a jigsaw piece. Grab all eight jigsaw pieces, and you get to go to the true last world of the game. Oh, and did I mention the sixth gobo in each level can only be found after collecting all five colored gems hidden within the level to open the crystal door, which then presents you with a challenge to save that final gobo. <gasps> Please stop. I can't breathe. The game suffers from a few problems, namely the fact it's difficult to turn crop, and you'll often find yourself awkwardly fidgeting round on the spot to line him up for certain jumps. That and the camera issues that plagued most 90s 3D platformers. On the Saturn version, there was a hilarious glitch in the EU that unfortunately resulted in hundreds of returned copies. See, if the disc was already in the Saturn when you turned the console on, the game would start but everything Thing would be missing its head. The only way around this glitch was to turn on the Saturn without any disc in it, pop in Croc, close the lid, and then boot the game from the Saturn's main menu. Otherwise, good game, sorely overlooked. Number 9. Hey you, want what's basically a 3D Streets of Rage slash Final Fight slash Double Dragon? Only it's all based around Star Wars Episode 1 and you can play co-op as any combination of a whole bunch of characters? Including Obi-Wan Kenobi, Qui-Gon Jinn, Mace Windu, Adigalia, and Plo Koon. Screw it, Darth Maul's a secret character and you can totally team him up with Samuel L. Jackson's Mace Windu. That is enough reason to buy this game right there. In all seriousness, this is a damn fun game to spend an afternoon blasting through with a friend. There are some nice gameplay touches, like being able to deflect lasers with your lightsaber, but for the most part, things are fairly straightforward. You know the plot of the movie, you know how to do everything the game requires of you within the first five minutes, but it's all addicting nonetheless. Number eight. If you're studying games design or thinking of putting out an indie title, you owe it to yourself to play this game. Shadow Dancer is a fantastic example of why enemy placement is important, as well as how you can teach a player certain rules without a single line of text. Typically, Shadow Dancer will introduce a new enemy on its own, in a relatively safe environment. You learn its pattern and the timings by experiencing them. Then it'll show you another enemy type or two. After this, it starts combining these enemies in interesting ways. For example, you have to jump on a ledge to take out a short-range enemy, but another one further away is firing projectiles in the path of the jump, making you consciously consider the timing of said jump. Add to this the fact that you have to save the hostages in a level in order to progress, and you notice the game has purposely placed everything to give you a series of discrete puzzles 
instead of the standard fare of a move left to right and kill everything in your way formula. This game is part of the Shinobi series, and in my opinion one of the best entries. The quality of the franchise spoke for itself in its prime, and this title's no exception. Number 7 Medieval on the original PlayStation has something of a cult following. Ghosts and Goblins also had a similar, though significantly larger, following before that. Imagine those two games having a baby, and you get Maximo. Do I really need to tell you anything more than that? Surely that's your justification to go track this game down right now. The game is as amazing as it sounds, and, thanks to relying on the cartoon aesthetic, has aged incredibly well. Number 6 Here's an interesting PlayStation 2 RPG where the towns you visit have been decimated. The various parts that make up the town are all hidden in a nearby dungeon. Your job is to essentially go dungeon crawl, then return to the town with the pieces, and get all Sim City by rebuilding it to your liking. Oh, and the dungeons are procedurally generated too, so things are kept somewhat fresh on a second playthrough. The battles can feel a little samey, but if you're playing a game that involves crawling through procedurally generated dungeons, you sort of expect to grind. The weird blend of gameplay styles gives you an experience quite unlike any other, and if you really enjoy it, there's even a sequel, Dark Chronicle. Number 5 Something you'll quickly learn about me, I like PS1 games with tank controls. Like way more than anybody reasonably should. Carrying a classic 90s sci-fi feel, Fear Effect separates itself from similar titles like Resident Evil by being a little more action-oriented. Heck, you can even dual wield. Enemies will be armed and they can drop ammo when killed. They can also be found in pretty decent numbers. In short, you're not just fighting slow shambling zombies and keeping your distance won't save you. Don't think that means this game can't be scary or atmospheric though. It oozes character, and little things like the clunking and whirring of a fan will really help bring the environments to life. There's also a sequel, Fear Effect 2, which actually acts as a prequel. Because of this, it was really hard to decide whether to put the first or second game on this list. Ultimately, although Fear Effect 2 is a prequel, I think you still get the best experience by playing through them in order of release. Number 4 Yes, there's a second game based on Star Wars Episode 1 on this list. That maybe says more about my childhood than it should. F-Zero was fun, Wipeout was okay, I guess, but Star Wars Episode 1 Racer? Now that's where it was at. I don't care if it's blasphemy. Episode 1 Racer was fast, frantic, filled with obstacles and shortcuts, and you knew damn well you were gonna have a good time when you popped it in. On the harder difficulties, you had to really learn the tracks and find any way you could to shave even a millisecond or two off of your time. The game actually provided a really decent challenge. Of course, it could have also just been that I sucked at the game. The coolest thing from the movie made into a brilliant game. What else is there to say? Number 3! You know what I love about Dynamite Cop? Despite being one of my favourite games, it's one that I never asked for and never expected to enjoy, making it that much more of a surprise. Cast your minds way back to the year 2000. Christmas morning, my mother decided to make me and my brother go through a scavenger hunt around the house with clues hidden everywhere to find our presents. First, we came across Metropolis Street Racer for the Dreamcast, then Dynamite Cop, then a Dreamcast memory card, followed by Sonic Adventure, and finally a Dreamcast console, which she decided to hide in the washing machine. Apparently it was the only place big enough that wasn't a cupboard and still had a door. Naturally, me and my brother put Sonic Adventure straight in, and it wasn't until a few days later that we actually played Dynamite Cop for the first time. It was then nigh on impossible to get us off that game. It plays like a 3D Streets of Rage slash Golden Axe slash everything you heard me say about Jedi power battles. You've got to hop on a cruise ship that's been overrun by modern day pirates and beat up everything in your path. You can pick up all sorts of weapons to help you, and you even get guns. What makes this stand out is the replay value. There are three different ways you can board the cruise ship and multiple endings you can achieve. That does result in the title being relatively short, and the gameplay doesn't get much beyond punch, punch, kick, kick, but that's perfect for what we wanted. Quick blasts on co-op, 
knowing we might see new routes or secrets, and confident we'd see the mission through to the end every time. Odd piece of trivia, but Dynamite Cop was actually a sequel to a Sega Saturn game I also loved called Die Hard Arcade. Die Hard Arcade is a firm favourite of me and a good friend, and it was truly difficult to decide which of the two games should make this list. Number 2 I've talked about this game before, but it deserves all of the love and attention it can get. Awesome battles with musical instruments in a game that can truly say it has unique gameplay. Seriously, no other game I've ever seen plays the same as Kataru Man. I've explained how the game works in my Top 10 Games That Need a Reboot, Remake or Sequel video, so I'll just reiterate that it's tricky, fast-paced, and an absolute blast. Likewise, the visuals give this a firm and fun identity. You can recognise Guitaru Man from miles away, and I wish more titles were brave enough to use such a distinct style. The game has one of the best original soundtracks I've ever had the joy of hearing, amplified by the fact that the music is a central gameplay mechanic. You want to do well in each stage just to hear the songs without any missed notes. It's to the point that, if I ever do a Top 10 Best Original Soundtracks video, Guitar Man will be a damn strong contender. Oh, and there's a port on the PSP too, so you can even Guitaru on the go! Number 1 Okay, yes, another game that appeared in a previous Top 10, but this game is so criminally underlooked and such a clear winner for this list, that omitting it simply for having been on a previous list just did not feel in the least bit justified. So, tank controls again, but you already know I like those for some reason. Here, I think it works in the game's favour with it being a psychological horror game. The controls mean you feel that little less confident and just a fraction more vulnerable. It adds to the tension and complements the game as a whole. The visual style, narrative, and warped characters in this game will get in your head and you won't get them back out. Over a decade later, I still find myself doing playthroughs of this game, and the world has stayed with me as being one of my absolute favourites. Truth be told, if I ever do a top 10 games of all time list, this is bound to be on there somewhere. In summary, want a more messed up Resident Evil with a twisted storyline that forces you to inject your character with strange chemicals in order to produce psychic powers, including a danger of overdosing? Get this game. This, one of the greatest games you'll ever play. So, with that said, what are your top 10 underappreciated games? What do you think does not get enough attention, and what would you like to see a little more love given to? I won't be me.